Uh, welcome back, everyone. We will uh, start from where we had paused. So we're at the end of uh, Equals Chapter 12 here. Talked about the chastening of the Lord. And uh, let's now go to the passage from verse 14 to 17. Uh, could someone please read it? Verse 14 to 17. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root or bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane pe person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it dil diligently with tears. Thank you, Christopher. So here in this passage, um, we are slowly moving into instructions for practical Christian living, uh, apart from the emphasis on faith and endurance. Now there are some instructions that we will begin to see. So it won't be smooth flowing, but here and there the instructions come in. So uh, for community life, for us to relate with each other as believers in Christ. He says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So two very essential uh, qualities, if you want to call them, he says, peace. Peace is getting right with people. So that is peace pursue or go after uh, having right relationships. So we have to make some effort in that area. And he says, holiness. Holiness, you have an entire course on holiness. Uh, I don't really have to explain that, but to really be like uh, Jesus, we, we need to desire it and we need to walk in it. And that's the way to uh, actually represent God. And so these two essential uh, qualities, virtues are important. The pursuing of peace, which is helpful in our relationships, holiness, which is helpful in our relationship with God primarily, and of course, with people. Then verse 15, he says, uh, he warns against uh, an evil okay, that we must never let fester uh, in us or in our communities and he uh, you know describes that as the root of bitterness a root of bitterness what is the root of bitterness the root of bitterness is um, he said pursue peace so it's the opposite of that when there are unresolved issues that in turn are you know festering feelings of hatred, of uh, jealousy. So uh, under, uh, underlying uh, fleshly, fleshly emotions, fleshly attitudes that we carry that hinder godly relationships uh, is what he's trying to uh, uh, warn us about. So he says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. So he also says that, yes, this is evil, root of bitterness. But at the same time, one needs to understand that a root of bitterness in a community of believers can cause a lot of trouble. Okay, So it needs to be dealt with quickly. So root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. So he's saying, don't even let it grow. The moment we 
notice it we have to nip it uh, at the at the uh, but so we've got to do that we've got to do that and as especially as pastors leaders maybe we're leading small groups we must be very sensitive to things like this unresolved matters between people uh, and when something is is brought to our notice you know, maybe god causes it to come to the fore or people bring it up then we must be catalysts in resolving that matter too so when things are resolved and the community is flowing together in relating rightly with one another that's healthy but if there is a root of bitterness and we let it stay on uh, sooner or later you know, it is going to uh, create a lot of trouble for the entire community so he wants the people about that and uh, verses 16 and 17 you know, this uh, is somewhat unsettling for some people because they they see that Esau right God God is saying that uh, Esau is what fornicator or profane person so how does it that you know God is calling an individual a fornicator and a profane person where uh, while the account about him in the Old Testament does not necessarily say that you know, he had uh, such a lifestyle so the issue really is faithlessness the issue really is uh, his devotion to what he wanted rather than what God wanted because we know that example right from his life where he was so hungry Jacob and him he, they had this discussion and he even sold his birthright for a morsel of food and so it shows us that there is this personality who did not put their faith in God who did not value spiritual inheritance so notice God is uh, showing uh, his his anger or his um, displeasure in people who walk without faith who do not value spiritual inheritance and it's pretty serious here because uh, you know, God is saying that he's a fornicator and a profane person somebody who's not walking in faith gives up their spiritual inheritance is equated uh, you know to all these evil uh, all all of this evil verse 17 for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing he was rejected for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears so god is reminding us that it's a very dangerous thing to give up our spiritual inheritance right but this is spiritual inheritance what is it you know the uh, multitude of promises in God's word, the promise, uh, especially you know, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's known as the promise of the Father. When Peter uh, makes a sermon, he calls it the promise of the Father, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the calling of God, the grace of God, the gift of God upon our lives, and what God wants us to accomplish in this lifetime. All of this is part of you know our spiritual inheritance and one when one says <clears throat> i don't want this i give it up for something else we trade the spiritual inheritance for an earthly temporal thing god is saying hey you know it, it's like esau that's what he did and that brought god a lot of displeasure and he does does not want uh, this community of jewish believers to be like that and it's a lesson for us as well that god wants us to run after his uh, call and his inheritance now moving to the last section here we will read from verse 18 to verse 24. could uh, somebody please help with reading that for you have come to for you have come to know the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of trumpet and the voice of the words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that was commanded. And if so, if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or sought with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said. 
I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to the Mount of Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirit of just man made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things, than that of Abel. Thank you, Abhinash. So here, um, he's talking about the new covenant once again. Uh, we've talked a lot about the old covenant uh, and the contrast of the old covenant with the new covenant earlier. So it's a repetition of the same thing. And he says uh, that the believers now who are in Christ Jesus, that they have come to Mount Zion. So when he talks about Mount Zion, Mount Zion compared to Mount Sinai. Now Mount Sinai is a picture of the old covenant. It's a picture of the way God dealt with his people in under the old covenant. So it was all law and they had to keep the law. They couldn't transgress. If you transgressed one law, it's like you break it, broken all the laws. So uh, all of that applied to them. But he's now saying that you're living in better things, not like your forefathers who uh, uh, you know did not have a mediator and who did not, um, you know, experience grace but you are now tasting of of the wonderful things because mount sinai is really a picture of fear so when the children of israel they saw the glory of god come down on mount sinai what what did it uh, do to them they were afraid we read that in exodus 20 you know the passage from 18 to 21 that they were actually afraid and they were scared to go because they knew that god is holy but that uh you know to to make restitution uh, for their sins it wasn't it, it wasn't possible by themselves but when we look at what jesus has done now we look at mount mount zion that is being spoken of so mount zion is the picture of the new covenant uh, now you know the church also is a picture of when we say mount zion even the church right we can think of the current church which is blood bought uh, which which is forgiven by our Lord Jesus Christ. So compared to Mount Sinai, which brings fear, Mount Zion talks about love, talks about, uh, you know, us being made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, our forgiveness. Okay, so uh, as we said earlier, it speaks of better things. And in this passage, there is a mention of the Lord Jesus as well as the mediator of the new covenant. So that uh, Mount Zion uh, represents and uh, talking about the blood of Jesus right? compared to uh, the blood of Abel, you know, that the blood of Abel called out to God for justice. But here we have the blood of Jesus. So it's like uh, it, it's sort of, uh, you know, a picture. It's saying that the blood speaks to God. OK, so what did the blood of Abel speak to God? I want justice. The blood of Jesus says, you know, the believers, those who are heirs of salvation, they are forgiven. Now they, they are now in the embrace of the Father. So it speaks of good things for us. And uh, he's reminding the Jewish believers, come on, everything is better. Everything is new. Uh, everything is wonderful. You have uh, your your eternal high priest, your God, your mediator of the new covenant and all of this. So uh, this is reason enough to pursue and uh, not let go of your faith. So that's the point that he is making. So uh, let's go forward. We will read from verse 25 to verse 29. Who would like to read? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, um, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape 
escaped with me reject him who wants from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may be made. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Okay, thank you. So, uh, in this passage, uh, there's a warning. So, he says, um, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. So, remember? We had that whole comparison of how Moses gave the law and those who did not keep the law, they had consequences. So how much more now that we have the Lord Jesus establishing the new covenant. So along those lines, he's saying that uh, let's not be disobedient. Uh, let's not refuse to get right with God, to do the right thing, uh, stay strong, stay bold. Right. So if we are ignorant, there are going to be consequences but instead you uh, be obedient to god and uh, he goes on to talking about the fact that the kind of kingdom that god is offering is an unshakable kingdom because the current circumstances of the believers would have made them feel that there is no stability isn't it uh, because uh, they they were going through persecution they were experiencing losses and, uh, you know, they, they felt that the kind of life, maybe some of them imagined that trusting in Jesus uh, was a life uh, devoid of, of challenges. And uh, they, they would have been really you know, sort of that this illusion meant happening to them. So uh, he's trying to tell them, look, it's not so much about the natural world. Okay, so even in the natural world, we are more than conquerors. That's that's the message of the Bible. Uh, but having said that, one thing that he wanted them to fix their eyes on was the eternal. And so uh, he's trying to tell them, look, God is is the God who, uh, in the present order, right, things will be shaken. Even this earth will be shaken. The kingdoms and the nations of the earth will be shaken. We know that. We know the things that are going to unfold. But uh, in the end. God is establishing a kingdom which will never be shaken. And so we uh, have got to be assured of that. And that must give us stability in our hearts. And having our eyes fixed on Jesus, having our eyes fixed on eternity, having our eyes fixed on this unshakable kingdom, right, which is, going, is, is uh, what we are a part of, he says, serve God acceptably serve god acceptably now again that we can talk about acceptably with reverence and godly fear uh, that is talking about holiness how we uh, understand god for who he is and in all that we do we we honor honor that right and uh, we have reverence or the right form of the fear of god in our uh, life, in our conduct, in our word, in our thoughts, in everything, uh, and serve God in that way. And the last uh, verse there, he says, for our God is a consuming fire. So he's just talking about the quality of God, and uh, he, he's sort of um, emphasizing that our God is powerful. Our God is powerful, because when we uh, consider fire, Right? What are the properties of fire? We know that uh, a fire can quickly uh, burn up things. And just now he's talked about shaking and unshakable kingdom. So our God is powerful. Uh, things which are temporal will be gone, but the eternal will stand. So uh, fire is like that. The chaff is burnt up, but the gold remains. And uh, so we must have the fear of God. We, uh, the way uh, the, there are passages of scripture that say, don't fear you know, those who can hurt your body, but we uh, fear him who can destroy right? even the spirit in eternity. So we trust our God. We walk with God with holy fear, knowing that, oh, 
he is powerful okay he is powerful and that's the understanding when it says our god is a consuming fire okay and everything is on his terms uh, and we just are, are here to see um, things unfold even if right now something seem unfair uh, or unjust let's wait for everything to take its course and uh, we we will see ultimately it is the lord our god who sits on the throne he loves at the uh, nations of the world so uh, that's the god that we serve so coming now to uh, chapter 13 let's uh, read over here you notice that you know line by line there'll be a different instruction so um, uh, we'll gain everything from even that one line which has been mentioned so could somebody kindly read verses one through three verses one to three it reads let brotherly love continue be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in the bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Okay, thank you, Asse. So uh, these are uh, addressing attitudes, um actions in a community setting so uh, he says let brotherly love continue and uh, that is from the greek word philadelphia uh, and, and the term there you know filio filio uh, refers to brotherly love brotherly love that believers are supposed to carry for one another so we must consider uh, all of us who are in Christ as brothers and sisters. And, you know, it, the dynamics is uh, quite different when someone is family. So there's no grace, hopefully, you know, there's more forgiveness. Uh, there is uh, care and affection and nurture uh, and all of that. So that's what he's saying. Look, as believers, uh, and even through the difficult times that you're going through, be there for each other, love one another, and uh, forgive one another. And verse 2. Don't forget to entertain strangers by and for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So uh, he wants them to have a hospitable um, attitude. And in the times of the uh, first century church, there were traveling ministers. Okay? So there were times when people would just go into a city and uh, proclaim the gospel uh, and good ministers of god when believers noticed that somebody was serving god this man they would be happy to host them or you know uh, uh give them food uh, shelter something do something for them so he says uh, this is commendable hospitality is uh, commendable it's an important virtue it's talked about it many other passages of scripture. So uh, Romans 12 talks about it, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Peter chapter 4. So don't stop it. Don't stop hospitality. And he also uh, points back to the uh, book of Genesis, a, a time when Abraham was being hospitable and he was actually hosting angels uh, and a uh, lot also, right? He encountered angels. So he's saying there's a possibility that you could actually be entertaining an angel. Then verse three, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. So, you know, uh, persecution was a reality of those times and it, it's not like you know they knew uh somebody's you know, somebody else's friend who wasn't it wasn't like that so their circumstances were such that known people were in the in the prisons also known people were being uh, uh you know uh, tortured for their faith persecuted for their faith uh, and so he's saying let's when there one part of the body is suffering everyone is suffering so we should have that sense of uh, um, grief and pain for those who are suffering and so he points out uh, especially to prisoners those who are being mistreated and he says feel for them or in other words we uh, use the term empathy have empathy for those who are in this situation that's that's true christian that's a true christian heart 
Okay, now moving on to um, the next section, verse 4 to verse 6. Uh, could somebody please read it? Verse 4 to 6. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, the bed on the fowl, but warmongers are an adulterous God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Should I continue? Huh? Uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Say. Okay. Uh, All right. Yes. So uh, verse 4, he says marriage is honorable. So honorable means that uh, it's good in, in God's sight. We know that he was the author of the very first marriage that happened in the Garden of Eden at uh, Adam and Eve. And it started with God. And he wants to remind the community that marriage is God's idea. It's God's design. It is uh, honored by God. And so it must be honored by the people. Uh, this marriage relationship, right? It must be looked at as pure. And then he talks about instances which are outside of marriage, such as fornication, adultery, and he brings a strong word to those who are living outside the boundaries of uh, marriage that God has created, right? And what the word talks about, he says, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge, okay? He is, he is not uh, uh, trying to, uh, like he's very direct in saying that uh, and uh, that must be taken seriously you know that first corinthians 6 as well paul warned the people uh, not to be uh, like promiscuous and uh, sexually to maintain purity because that is uh, very important in our walk with the lord and uh, uh, he also talks about the love of money so it was five he says let your conduct be without covetousness covetousness is to want what somebody else has uh, it is to delight in what is not ours so uh, that kind of an attitude right uh, particularly when it comes to money um, uh, it's it's not good uh, we know that uh, when paul wrote to timothy he said that uh, a contentment right with godliness that's that's very important uh, and so uh, the character which is free of the love of money is what one should have and uh, this is also important so he addresses the issue of marriage he addresses the issue of uh, money uh, and he says that uh, we must put our trust in god to have our needs met uh, and which is what he's saying, you know, from, I, I'll read verse 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So, you know, it, it's actually verse 5 and verse 6 are continuation. So basically what he's saying is, look, don't. Don't try to get what others have. Be happy with what you have because God has said that he is our provider. So you look to God and you say, it's like a reflection. When God is saying I'm your provider, you say God is my provider. It's like when God is saying I'm your healer, you say I'm healed. When God is saying I'm your redeemer, you say I'm redeemed. So it's it's responding, it's reflecting to what God has already spoken about himself. So he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so I boldly say, yes, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So God is our provider. So the area of needs, in the area of money, uh, uh, he says, look, Jehovah Jireh, don't forget that. That covenant is still valid. Uh, and God will take care of us. Uh, verses 7 through 9, please. Someone, could you read it? 7 to 9, he reads, Remember them which have the rule over you, 
who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose fate follow considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, be not carried about the, with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is good a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have be, not profited them that have been occupied therein. Okay, so more instructions follow. Uh, uh, in verse 7, he's talking about godly leadership. And he says, look, when you find godly leadership, uh, people who are truly um, contributed to the increase of our faith, who helped us grow uh, in, in the word of God, in our walk with the Lord, uh, he says, it's good to follow such such uh, leaders and uh, he also says observe their lives right observe their lives um, faith in god obviously bears fruit so there is an outcome to their conduct so as you look at them as you observe them if there are things that you can learn from their lives then you take that from their example follow it live it and uh, that will be helpful for you so basically, we say, learn from godly leadership. And in verse 8, uh, uh, he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's another way of him saying that there is uh, stability in God. We don't have a God who changes like the weather or changes like the seasons or changes like uh, the mind of man. But uh, he remains the same. Uh, and, and so... Uh, you know, we, we have that stability. So he's continuing to remind the believers from verse 8, uh, going back to, you know, that, that same tone of saying, don't go back, don't give up. He's saying there is stability in Christ. Uh, and therefore, now verse 9, he says, do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. So there can be new teachings that come up or uh, even, um, uh, you know, uh, the old things sort of twisted but don't go with them. Go with what what has been there. Jesus, even Jesus is the same, right? Yesterday, today, and forever. And what he's saying would not change. And so be uh, grounded and rooted in the truth of God's word, in the truth of who God is. And he is warning them against traditions. So he says, let not the heart be, uh, let it be established with grace and not with foods. So again, traditions because they were used to uh, uh, a lot of traditions so he's saying come on now you are part of the grace of god and uh, so you, you have a new life live it you know, in the uh, new manner uh, let's move ahead we now are at the no again doesn't seem to come <laughs> so we still have verses to go but that's okay because we're learning something here verses 10 through 16 uh, could Thank someone you. read this yeah, maybe somebody else, if uh, you all don't mind, we, we'll have a new person read it. Okay, Divya. Uh, Divya, I, uh, you can read it. I just noticed a question here. I'll look at it uh, in the chat. What are biblical directions to believers so that we may not host the devil who comes like an angel of light? Biblical directions. Uh, so, Kennedy, I, I believe that a child of God would recognize if, even if the, uh, even if the devil came as the angel of light, because uh, a child of God who's walking with him uh, will be familiar with the presence of God, with the voice of God. You know, when we uh, read John chapter 10 over there, uh, scriptures say that my sheep know my voice. But when the thief comes, they do recognize that this is actually not the shepherd. All right? So it just, it just uh, takes some moments for us to recognize. So I, I think it's an innate thing. That, that's how uh, we are as children of God. But if there is, let's say, uh, uh, a young believer, okay, uh, then yes, there, there could be 
uh, challenges because they are just getting trained, right, in, in uh, mm -hmm. understanding the presence of God, understanding the voice of God. So what will help uh, that for them not to host the devil is the right teaching. So if they are taught the right way, they're established in uh, the principles of God's word, then they too will recognize quickly and uh, they won't host the devil. Okay, So uh, that's what I believe. Firstly, uh, that as sheep, we already hear the voice of God and that uh, faculty can be strengthened by our uh, spending time with God. Okay. Does, does that make sense, Kennedy, or is there anything more you want to ask or if yeah. others have any questions? Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm asking for this question of uh, there are people who, who take advantage advantage of uh, Christianity. Okay, When you host them, then they, they become what okay, they're not supposed to be. To be. Like the cases where you've seen where pastors or ministerial leaders have been swindled or led into, into making bad, bad decisions. So, thank you. Okay, I got uh, where you're coming from. Uh, thank you, Kennedy, for that. Um, so you're saying that uh, well-meaning believers end up hosting, uh, you know, so-called uh, preachers and apostles and all who may actually be false. So how do we prevent that? Well, uh, we will learn more about it because uh, the book of Peter, uh, the episodes of Peter, they talk about it quite elaborately. Uh, and I'm sure you would have uh, studied the episodes of Apostle John also warning the believers to identify such people. So how do we identify uh, false teachers, false ministers of God by their fruit? That's how we identify them. So when remember, even now in this passage, we said godly leaders and the outcome of their faith, right? the outcome of their li godly lifestyle. So there's always an outcome. When we look at the outcome, on the basis of the outcome, we can tell whether hey, is someone truly serving the Lord or not serving the Lord, right? So that's how it is. So we judge on the basis of the fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, there, there's more actually, even the witness of the Holy Spirit, because the Bible says, Romans 8, 16, that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And so sometimes, uh, can be like as we are listening to people or we are observing people, uh, I'm not saying the human sense of judgment, because we all have that. You know, we, we tend to, there's a tendency to judge others. But uh, even beyond that, a spiritual sense of discernment, you know, it, it can function in us because the Holy Spirit is kind of uh, helping us know something is wrong. And we must actually uh, be open to that. Okay. Uh, so be listening to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and also the gift of the Holy Spirit can be operational in us. You remember, uh, there is this lady uh, in uh, the book of Acts when uh, Paul goes to minister in Philippi who, who starts saying, oh, these are the servants of the Lord. Uh, listen to them. It sounds like free publicity. But what does he do? He rebukes the devil. He casts out the demon uh, out, out, of, out of that slave girl. Uh, how did he know? You know, it, one may have thought, oh, God has sent an angel to promote Paul's ministry. But he recognized because there's also something known as the gift of discernment, which functions in us. So we can tell an angel from a devil. It, it is possible. It can happen just like that as well because of the gift of discernment. So all these senses... When we begin to exercise, it becomes rather easy to discern. I would say discern and not use the word judge. So let's not judge, but uh, let's be discerning, right? Uh, judge in the sense, putting people down. Okay, that, in that context, I'm saying that. All right, so uh, well, let's move on ahead. Um, uh, Divya, yeah, you were supposed to read the next section here. Yeah. Please go ahead. Sure. Uh, verse 10 onwards, uh, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle 
have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are buried outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Mm. So uh, here in this passage, talking about Jesus and his sacrifice, uh, he says that uh, those who are not saved, right? they cannot come to the altar and who has become the sacrifice jesus has become the sacrifice uh, and uh, you know just like the animals that uh, were taken in whose blood was brought into the sanctuary and they were burned outside the camp similarly you know the lord jesus he shed his blood he suffered outside the gate so uh, in a sense when he says outside the gate uh, you could you could kind of you know, uh, look at him as somebody who was not accepted as a high priest, isn't it? Or until the writer of the Hebrews here described why Jesus is the high priest. But for the people, uh, he is a, he's outside of that line of high priest. Uh, but he says, okay, come on, he suffered outside the gate. So outside the gate can be understood in, in various ways. And verse 13, therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So uh, we, we are also encouraged, right, that uh, the Lord Jesus, the way he was kind of uh, outside of the thinking of the Jewish believer, like the Jewish believer didn't think of Jesus uh, as an acceptable high priest and as, as an acceptable sacrifice and as uh, more acceptable than Moses. Uh, and so there was a reproach on Jesus or he was sort of rejected. So uh, he's saying that now that they are going through testing times and feel the same way, uh, it's relatable. That if Jesus, what you're going through, is is nothing jesus experienced reproach you know reproach so now you bear his reproach okay now we are being shamed for believing in jesus that's okay i mean don't uh, don't let that crush you is the point that he is making and then he points to eternity because he's saying uh, we we seek the city to come so he is asking for an eternal mindset uh, and he talks about spiritual sacrifices so not uh, the temple sacrifices any longer, uh, but spiritual sacrifice. So what are our sacrifices that we bring to the Lord as we enter into his presence? Praise. Praise is a sacrifice that we bring to the Lord as we enter his presence. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And uh, one preacher, uh, you know, uh, Okay, anyway, let's let's not uh, <laughs> go uh, beyond this. So we'll limit it that, at that. Verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God, God is well pleased. So two spiritual sacrifices uh, have been mentioned here. One is praise. The other is giving, giving, sharing. God considers that as a spiritual sacrifice. So if we want to offer, offer up sacrifices to God, uh, it must be a part of our lifestyle that you know we praise God, we give, we share, and uh, God sees that and He takes notice of that. Okay, say uh, you had, you want to say something? Yes, Pastor. I was just, yeah. um, um, I was listening along the lines of when you talked about uh, um, the similarity of what was done in the temple outside of the temple where they would make the sacrifice and burn it at the altar and then that of the death of jesus christ which was at golgotha outside of the jerusalem gate i was just thinking couldn't it be could the hebrew writer be making a um a similarity 
to bring to the minds of the Hebrew um, listeners there to show them what was already fulfilled in Christ. I don't know if that's another angle to look at it because we it's you can match you can match what was being done you know in the old covenant to what Jesus now fulfilled which makes it clear that look there's no longer any need for any sacrifice this is Jesus Christ who was crucified outside of the gate is similarity in similitude to what was being practiced or what was instructed of them to practice so that they could get the blood and sprinkle later inside the inner court. I don't know if that's another good angle to look at it from. Yes, I think so. Yeah, that, that should be fine also. So Thank you. because there's, there's nothing specific, uh, you know, that has been told to us. So we, we can make all these connections and it, it's not so outside uh, the context. So it's OK. OK. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. OK. So. Uh, yes, the next set of scriptures here with the conclusion, finally. Uh, so we will read from verse 17 uh, all the way to verse 25. Who will do the honors? It's the last portion. Okay, cool. Please go ahead. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother uh, Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay. So uh, just some closing thoughts here where he calls the people to obey the leaders, submit to them, and uh, uh, to remember that the leaders nurture them and God holds the leaders accountable for their service and ministry, which has been uh, towards the people who have been entrusted to them. And uh, knowing that uh, the leaders have uh, great responsibility, so he encourages the people to cooperate uh, with them and give them joy right, uh, by um, uh, walking and, and growing uh, in the Lord, uh, which will be a blessing to the people. And uh, he says that uh, pray, pray for uh, him. Oh, who is this person? Still speculation, right? Most people say it's it's Paul, but uh, anyhow. So he's saying pray for pray for us, uh, and he wants to come. He wants to meet the people, and then he makes this prayer of uh, blessing and a prayer that sort of commits me the God of peace who brought uh, you up. So he basically commits the people and he says, okay, let the Lord uh, strengthen you, may make you complete in every good work to do his will. So this is a prayer which we can pray, right, for ourselves, for one another, verse 20 of uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And in closing, you know, he um, brings them um, uh, news that I have written to you in few words, know that our brother Timothy has been set free. So he brings up news about the release of Timothy. Okay, so this is another reason why people say, oh, this is actually Paul, but anyhow. Um, and then finally, you know, the closing uh, greetings here, greet all those who rule over you uh, and uh, grace be with you all. Amen. So that's the way that she has concluded. Uh, all right, so let's just pray and close. Uh, I'm sorry, I really couldn't engage the amount of time so i'll have to uh, start with james afresh uh, and uh, we will pick that up in the next class uh, could somebody please pray 
and we will close for today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we bless you and thank you for another class, Lord. Studying the book of Hebrews, studying all that, Lord, you have done for us, what you fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And thank you for all the instructions, Lord, you laid upon the heart of Paul and that, Lord, still benefits us today. We pray that these words that we are learning and have learned, we pray that, Lord, you will give us the grace to do them and that, Lord, we will choose you always above every other thing and never sell our bet right in you for the world's um, carrots or for whatever the pleasures of the world that present are presented to us. I pray, Father, that uh, you would continue to uphold our teacher, you continue to strengthen her and increase her in every way. We bless you, Father, for the next class coming up, and we pray that you would impact us with wisdom as we are being instructed, Lord, in the things that will be equipped will be will be used to equip us, Lord, for the task ahead. Thank you, everlasting Lord. We bless you and we glorify your holy name. Thank you for answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Say. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Hope you've enjoyed the book of Hebrews. Uh, excited to start with uh, James in the next session. God bless you. Have a, a great weekend. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Bye.